Welcome all of you guys that are joining, some of you that are over in Auditorium A right now. I just got to be in with some of the worship with you. That was great. Everyone that's on Church Online and some of you that are in Orlando right now, go to Romans chapter 8 and stand to your feet, if you would, just to give honor to God. And we're starting a series called Abba. Everyone say Abba. Abba. Talking to Abba, which means Father. And I'd love it if you took out a Bible and just joined me. We're going to start in Romans 8 verse 1. And for these next few weeks, we're going to be meditating, thinking, and hopefully being healed by God as our Father. So Romans 8 is where we are. If you're ready, say, let's do it. Verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Skip down to verse 14. For all who are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now let's pray. Father, I'm asking you for fresh power to speak these words and to hear these words and for us to experience this reality in the great, strong, mighty name of Jesus. And everybody shouted, amen. amen. Go ahead and have a seat, Auditorium A. How many of you know John 3.16 by heart? Any of you know John 3.16 by heart? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You know, I've never been a fan of John 3.16. I've never been a John 3.16 fan. I'm not saying I don't believe it. I know it's in the Bible. I'm saying I have, I have always struggled with the fact that the most popular Bible verse that there is, is this one, because it, it arouses the, the controversy of the Trinity. For God to love the world that he gave his only son. I, I, I've had conversations with the Lord. They went like this. If I were writing the Bible, I would have said, for God so loved the world that he gave himself so that whoever believed in himself would not perish, but with himself have everlasting life with himself. I would have said something like that because to throw the son and the father and, and all that stuff in there, it just, boy, does it make it complicated. If you've ever had a child that, that you were describing, so they'd say, how many gods do we have, daddy? And it's like, there's three gods? No, there's one God. Well, well, then who is God's son? Well, that's Jesus. Well, who's Jesus? Well, he's God. I thought he's God's son. He is. To which, a, like a four-year-old, look back at you and say, does that make sense to you? You know? And it's, and it's a difficult thing, and great is the mystery of godliness, and clearly there is a complexity. What I've tried to do, especially when addressing people of other cultures or other religions, I usually avoid it, you know, altogether. You know, uh, I'm an expert, uh, ev you know, I evitar is the word in, in, in Spanish, and so I'll just regularly find myself, you know, evito, evito, I'm going to just go ahead and avoid this right now. And yet, as I've dug into this passage and I've dug into this series on God as our Abba, God as our Father, I've come to realize my friends, this is not a doctrine to be avoided, and this is not a reality to be somehow embarrassed by, but there is a truth that is more central than we can even realize in the fatherhood of God. There are many realities of God. There are many roles that God plays. Indeed, God is gracious, and God is Savior, and He is Redeemer, and He is a bridge, and He is a rock, and He is the way, and He is the truth, and He is a shepherd, and He is light, and He is living water, and He is many, many, many things and many roles that He plays. And yet, when Jesus came to earth, the primary revelation He gave, the primary way in which He related to God was as Father. Every time He spoke to Him, it seems like He's saying, 
father. He's describing him as father. Now this matters because you need to understand that Jesus is not simply creating access whereby we can now gain uh, the presence of God. He's not just giving us access. He's coming as the son that is showing us the example and the model of how when you become fully human, this is how you will relate to God, which is why when the disciples said, teach us to pray, he did not say, when you pray, pray like this. Our master who art in heaven, our redeemer who art in heaven, our, even our Lord who art in heaven. He is absolutely those. Jesus is Lord. That's a confession that will save your soul at some level. What I'm telling you, though, is there's something significant, clave, something that is substantial about the reality that Jesus reveals the Father. All of you in Orlando right now, Father. Say the word. Say Abba. This is the essence of this series, and it's the essence of the sermon today, that we rise and fall on our understanding of God as our Father. To put more um, explicitly, our souls need a daddy, and when we have it, we thrive, and when we don't have it, we compensate in destructive ways. Let me say it one more time. Our souls need a daddy, and when you don't have a daddy, you might not know you're doing it, but you will compensate. You will find other ways to compensate for the lack of what your soul was made for, which is a daddy. Point number one, we need to know God as Father. Verse 15 is kind of the the memory verse of the day if we were doing children's church. Verse 15, it says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. In other words, that's our native state. Our native state is fear. We didn't receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We need to know God as Father. Now, the word father, it's a Hebrew word. It's ab, just A-B, ab. You've got mom, which would be like im. And so like a little kid, uh, rabbis have told me a little kid would say abba, abba. Take the word ab, add a little ah to it, abba. And then a a little kid about mother would say, or like mom or mommy would say uh, imma, imma, you know, like that. So you've got abba. And so this idea is it came from that. Well, Jesus and his disciples and a lot lot of these guys spoke most likely Aramaic. They were uh, like the street language would have been Aramaic, which is a derivative of Hebrew, which is where they got this term for father in Aramaic which was Abba. Now, if you've been a Christian for a little while, you've probably heard uh, at least some Christian somewhere that will pray like Daddy God. You'll meet someone who will say, oh, I'm praying, oh, Daddy God. And uh, he's Daddy God because I can call him Daddy God because of Abba and because of the idea that Abba means Daddy and it's uh, and all that. Well, the the, the whole notion, that's kind of a new notion, actually. It's, you know, back in, I think it was like the 70s, there was a a Lutheran scholar named um, Joachim Jeremias who really uh, explained this idea, this concept of the, rather than being a formal father, uh, that God is kind of near. And that's where a lot of people picked up on this and said, Abba means daddy, to which a lot of other scholars kind of picked up and started pushing back, feeling like the transcendence of God was being threatened and saying, no, 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 you're getting a little too close to call him, you know, daddy. He's not your daddy. If he was daddy, then translators would have written daddy, but they kept it as Abba because it's just trying to show you that he's, it's speaking the language just like a 90 year old would have described their father as Abba in Aramaic. So stop doing that, just call him father, just like it says. And so you got this kind of thing going back and forth. And I just want to let you know, I've read, I mean, a lot on all that stuff. I've read, spent quite a bit of time looking into all of that. And yet when I come to the bottom of this discussion and this issue, I've got to still ask the question, if Abba means nothing but a formal father, then why in the world is Paul using the word Abba, which is an Aramaic word, when he's writing to Greek speakers in Rome, when he says, you receive a spirit of adoption by which you cry, Abba, Father. To which I have to tell you, I, I, I land on the conclusion, and, and my opinion on this is, there is something about this word Abba that's deeper and stronger and more nuanced than simply saying Father. More to the point, I've got one of my daughters I'm watching right now in the service with me. I don't want her calling me Father. In fact, one of the greatest con- uh, confessions that I love more than anything is when she calls me, guess what I like to be called? Daddy, when, I, when one of my daughters turns 50 years old, do you think I'm going to be upset if she's still calling me daddy? I kind of get annoyed that when a young kid is like calling me dad or when I watch a kid call someone like, Miss, I don't want to be, I'm not Mr. Pats, you know? I, I, you know, I don't mind being called king occasionally, but I, I want to be. 
There's something about this. You see, our souls need a daddy. And when we have a daddy, we thrive. And when we don't, we compensate in these ways. And so what we have right now is, is a problem with language. So like if I want to describe love, I've got a problem describing love because love has lost its bite. So when I say love, we don't know what that means. I love you. Well, do you mean you love me like you love pizza? Do you mean you love me like you love that show last night? Or do you mean you love me in a way that you will never fail me or you're never going to leave me? What do you mean you love me? Which is why the Bible's got multiple words for love, one of which is agape. And sometimes you'll hear someone describing, oh, you know what? The Bible's describing here is what we call agape love. This is agape love. This isn't brotherly love. This isn't, um, you know, this isn't erotic love. This is agape love. It's others centered love. And so the problem with the word love is that even though the word love is perfect, our imperfections of perception require us to modify the word by letting us know what kind of love we're talking about. I believe that's exactly what Paul is doing here in Romans 8. Same thing happens in Galatians chapter 4. When it says, we cry out, Abba, Father, I believe, auditorium may listen to me, I believe there is something significant about Paul talking to Greek speakers that knew the Greek word, pater, and they could have just easily said, we cry out and we call him pater, Father, this formality like that. But I think Paul was on to something. My friends, there is something pivotal in the soul of every human. You need a daddy. And when you've got a daddy, when you've got that, you thrive. This is why if you've got a great relationship with your father, every stat in the world says the stronger your relationship with your earthly father, the more successful, the more stable, the more everything you're going to be. The worse your relationship with your father on this earth is, the harder thing. Now, obviously, fathers on earth can't do everything you need them to do, which is why there's a part of your soul that ultimately has got to connect with our father, which art in heaven, and we cry, Abba. Abba. Do you know him as Abba? Because you need to know him as your father. I would dare say we live in a fatherless culture that has led to emotional orphans. And I would even argue right now that a majority of the Christians that I meet very often are functional orphans that come to churches and we treat our churches like little orphanages and we relate to a God who we think of him as a master and he is the master, but I just got to tell you, he is master. But you, it, unless you understand that the master is also your daddy, you will never relate the right way to the master. Do you see what I'm saying? And so when we treat churches like orphanages where the orphans all gather together because all week long they've been having to fend for themselves and they've been hiding food in their pockets so no one gets it. And they've been having to watch out for number one all week long. And so they come to church every week where they're hoping that the director of the orphanage will appear. And when he does, oh, the little orphans love it. When he gives me a Tic Tac or he gives me an M&M and they're like, oh, I love to go to church every week because all week long I've been, I've been empty all week. But man, when I come on, on Sundays, I hope they sing some songs that the little orphans love because if they'll sing some little orphan songs, I get a little shot in my arm and, oh, I got a little pick me up. And then the orphanage director, he leaves again and I'm kind of stuck to the realities of the orphan's life and, and I just kind of exist like this from one, or maybe you join a micro church and your micro church is like that or you do something, you go to a campus group or something and you're like, oh, I get to, the, 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 I, I get to visit with the orphanage director even twice a week or thrice a week. Whoa. I, oh, he looked at me this way. Oh, I got a goose bump. I, I felt a little something. The director of the orphanage looked at me. What a great master he is. But God's will was never that the church was going to be an orphanage for orphans. It's supposed to be the house for the sons and daughters of God. God is not interested in getting visitation rights on the weekends. He wants full-time custody. That's how much he wants you. I remember when I was a kid, I, I always wanted to please my dad. My parents were divorced, and so I didn't have a dad around most of the time. And I just remember, for whatever reason, I wanted my dad to be proud of me. And so if I got good grades, I wanted dad to know about it. If I was doing something, I wanted my dad to know about it. And, and, and when he was happy with it, it made me happy. And, and when he wasn't, there, it felt like something was missing. And, and there's something in us. There's, what is it about it, like uh, us where we, we go through life? And, and the problem is when we come and we project these images on our God to where, like for me, and I'm not saying it was my dad, 
dad's fault, but it just, it seemed like it felt like it was never enough. It was never quite good enough. It's like, oh, you can never quite measure up to what it is. And, and of course he would have stuck around if you could, it's, you know, sort of what goes through a kid's mind. And so next thing you know, you're sort of look, going through life thinking like an Olympic diver that at all times you're being measured. Oh, that was a seven or that was an eight or occasionally you get a 9.3 and you're like, oh, but it could have been better. And there's the, to that, Paul now comes and he writes this in this epistle in Romans chapter eight, Romans being, I would argue the, the pinnacle of a, of a, a theology of the gospel, the great news of Jesus. And might I say to me, Romans eight is the pinnacle of the pinnacle. It's the brightest of the shining of the, you know, to me, what, what is the, like concentrated, glorious gospel efficiency and potency in this. And it's like, what is this? And we start here. It says, there is therefore now, no. Now, a lot of times the word therefore gets used in our, you know, context in a gratuitous way. Pretty much every scholar tells you when you get to the beginning of this, and I know we're going to talk about condemnation here, but therefore means he's looking back on something and he's either summing up and breaking, break, getting it to a point, or he's summing up what's already been said in chapters one through seven, or he might specifically be summing up. And if you've never read Romans six and seven, go read Romans six, seven, eight. I mean, get that stuff concentrated. That's worth like an hour just sitting there reading, 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 thinking, chewing, and being like, good Lord, you're amazing. That's what will happen when you really digest that stuff. But he comes now and he says, therefore, in light of all of this gospel reality, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Jesus. Now, the reason this matters is we're going to get to the confession in verse 15, Abba, Father. But before we get there, you've got to know this. This is not a father whom you cannot please. This is not a father who is mad. I hear people all the time say, I always feel like my dad was mad. Romans 8.1 means this. God is not mad. Let me, let me even take it deeper. God is satisfied. You're like, I, I want to please God. When you put your faith in Jesus, the Messiah, you have pleased God. I want to please God to believe Jesus. Mike, I want so bad to do something great for God. Believe Jesus. Well, I already did. Then you are. <laughs> you mean fathers, please? 10, 10, 10, 10. Oh, that's impossible. No, what's in, what's in, the reason why it feels impossible is because we have these feelings. We've got these nagging feelings of guilt. And, and I'm not, there is therefore now no condemnation. There's no damnation. There's nothing, there's no judgment that's going to come against you because you're in Christ Jesus, because of what Jesus has done. So in verse two, when it says the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death because God has done, God has done. The gospel is what God does, not what you do. God has done what the law weakened by the flesh couldn't do by sending his own son the likeness of sinful flesh for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. What this means is like a soldier that comes home from battle and his leg has been cut off. He's lost a leg in battle. And there's, you ever heard of the reality where someone's lost a limb, but they go to the doctor and say, hey doc, I'm having pain in my left leg. And the doctor says, you don't have a left leg. Yeah, it's impossible. You know, you shouldn't be having pain in your left leg. Well, can I get some codeine? Because I got pain in my left leg. To which he's like, there is no left leg anymore. Don't you understand? I know you're sensing it. It feels so very real. You're experiencing pain. You need to know this though. The ligament is gone. What God is saying here is that the father that you have, not only is he not mad, he's utterly satisfied because there was only one thing that would get him dissatisfied with you. There was a ligament called sin. And when you put your faith in Jesus, the ligament called sin has been amputated forever. So you may be having muscle memory of a pain called guilt and condemnation in your brain, but rest assured, it's in your brain. It's not in your ligament because the ligament called sin is now hereby erased, deleted, eradicated, amputated for the rest of your eternal life. Amen. Amen. Auditor do you realize what good news this is? This means, well, wait, but Mike, but what about the feelings? I'm not saying the feelings aren't there. What I'm saying is the, the key, part of the key to life is realizing I know I'm having feelings of my old orphan's lifestyle, but I am no longer an orphan. This means a supreme deal that I'm trying to preach against now is that there's many of you that love God and God loves you and you are children of God. And yet you're living like functional orphans. Many of us receive enough of God's grace for justification and for forgiveness, but not very much for real life. 
Yeah, but Mike, I, I don't deserve God's grace because I keep on saying, I assure you, the reason you keep falling into the same junk is because you're still believing that the appendage is still there, but it's gone. It's gone. But what if it comes back? It doesn't grow back. You're not a salamander. There's no sin growing back. That leg, it's, that, that thing gets chopped off. It's gone forever. See, a lot of us have adopted a Christianity of forgiveness, but we have not adopted a Christianity of intimacy. And the message of Abba is that not only does God forgive you enough to put you in an orphanage, but he loved you enough to put you in his home and to become intimate with him. Good news, friends. Number one, we need to know God is that father, the father that's been satisfied, the father that when he looks at you, he, his eyes light up. They don't go, oh, you again. Number two, we need to know ourselves as sons. Verse 14, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. To which some of the ladies in here might say, well, I don't like this. The Bible's so sexist. You know, I'm not a son. I'm a daughter. Can we please update the 21st century? No, I'm not going to do that. The word is sons. That The word is sons. That's what it is. The word is a son. In the first century, sons had rights. Jesus is the son. Here's why even all you ladies in here, even if you're a feminist, you need to catch this. You, when you come to Jesus and his spirit comes in you, you become a son. This doesn't mean you become masculine. It means your position, positionally, you become a son. Positionally, everything that the son of God, Jesus, has, which means Jesus has the son, the firstborn son, the rights he gets, prayers get answered, protection is provided, angels show up on the spot, God's got your back. Everything the son gets, all of the little sons, get because of the son. When you are in the son, you live as a son that's just like that son. And that's good news. You hear what I'm saying, son? You hear what I'm saying? Okay. Some of you might say, well, I don't like that. Well, no, you, you, if you read earlier in this chapter, he's going to say things like in Christ Jesus, you know, there's, there's neither male nor female and there's, you know, all this kind of business about the, you know, there's not slaves and frees. That's what Paul hits at. And by the way, any of you that are men here, the Bible teaches that as uh, all of us that belong to Jesus, we're part of what's called the bride of Christ. So, so you don't, don't get stuck on gender issues. God is the, you know, Jesus is the bridegroom. We are the bride. It doesn't like ignite my natural feelings when someone's like, how does it feel to be part of the bride? I'm like, <laughs> The Bible says it. So yeah, I'm there, you know. Um, but I get what the point is, which is that, that there's some reality of where, where we come to God. And by the way, this is great news. It means if you're a male or a female, every single one of us by faith, we come equally on equal footing at the foot of the cross, whereby we get lifted up and become the children of God. See, we've got to know ourselves as sons. Verse 15, it says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but the spirit of adoption. So in the first century, usually the one that would be adopting somebody would be some wealthy person that had no heir. And you don't want to die without an heir and your name going on. And so they would go and they would adopt somebody. And several things happened when, when you got adopted. One of which was all of your old debts and legal obligations were taken care of by your father who was adopting you. Does that sound like good news? Who would love for all of your debts to be taken out? Like, if Bill Gates came and said, I'd like to adopt you. Can I pay off all your student loans? How many of you would say, blessed be the name of the Lord? <laughs> all legal obligations. Okay, that's one thing. Next thing, you got a new name. If you used to be called Smith, now you'd get like a way better name. Let's just say Pats. You'd get a name like Pats, okay? <laughs> All right, so you, you, you lost your old name and you got a new name. Now, sometimes you'd make a mistake. You'd be signing a check or something like that. You'd, you're like, oh man, my bad, I forgot. You ever done that? Like it's 2015 and you're still running 14 because you're stuck on 14, but you forgot you're in 15 and that's how a lot of us live. We're in the new name, but we're still signing checks with the old name because we forgot we're in the new name. We still think we're orphans when we're really sons. The old is gone. Happy New Year. <laughs> We need to see ourselves as sons. You got a new name. I love this part. When you got adopted, your father now takes responsibility for all your actions. He's now going to take legal responsibility for your actions. So if you've been smoking too much opium while you're driving your double hump camels into someone's hut, you knock it down. <laughs> <laughs> Your father, and I realize someone's like, I never get tempted with that. I don't understand. You know, your father, <laughs> your father is taking responsibility. This does not mean there are not consequences. 
See, Hebrews 12 says that God disciplines us. But know this, when you get adopted by God, you may be disciplined by God, which is controlled amounts of fathering from God, which will never be more than you. You may be disciplined, but for the rest of your eternal life, you will never again receive wrath. That will never happen to you. Because now you're a son. Now you've been adopted. Your father is taking responsibility for your actions. The other cool part about this is that, you know, if you're a natural son, you could actually get written out of the will. But once you got adopted, you wouldn't even get written out of the will. It's an inheritance that's secure. Now, now what this does, I need you to see this. What this does is it does two things simultaneously. On one hand, adoption is very humbling. When you're adopted, now you have to understand first century, watch the auditorium may catch this, and Orlando, don't miss this. In first century, adoption didn't have stigma to it, like sometimes you'll hear people throwing it around now. But But when someone got adopted, it's humbling because you're being adopted by some daddy war box. You're being adopted by some benefactor. You're being adopted by some wealthy person that can afford to adopt you. You're being adopted. And it's humbling because you realize, by nature, I am not a child of this person. By nature, I'm not a child of the past. By nature, I'm not a child of this person. Naturally speaking, I've got no business being in this family, but I've now been legally adopted and I now have a choice before me, which is, will I live in the light of my new re- legal reality, or am I going to live in the pain, painful muscle memory of my lost appendage Smith self? Which reality am I going to live in? And so it's very humbling. Now, by the way, if you're not catching this, the gospel of Jesus says this, by, by nature, all of us are children of wrath. What this means is even in a world like ours that deifies humanity and says all people are good, the Bible Bible says that is a lie. All people are not good. Little children are born as children of wrath. What you say, but what about my sweet little four-year-old Johnny? Sweet four-year-old Johnny is a child of wrath. That's what he is, okay? (laughs) It's humbling. This is where the gospel is very humbling because it means you are so full of wrath, so full of sin, so even when you do good things, you'll do them for bad reasons, that nothing but adoption can get you out of your trouble. And it's very humbling because you know by nature you're a child of wrath. But then it does this other thing because adoption flips you around. Because on the other hand, you've been loved by someone that's got the skills to pay the bills and he's got the the bank to back it up and he's got the, the wealth and he's got the competency. And for some reason, he's got affection that he comes into an orphanage and he looks at some scrawny little, little kid that's stuck in her sin, some little boy that's devastated in his sin, and scrawny, and you look at him, and his eyes are, are cloudy, and his hair is, is matted, and, and, his, and his lips are bad, and his breath stinks, and he looks bad, and he's got bad body, and he brings nothing to the table, and this great benefactor comes and says, I want him, and when he gets, and this is what happens, there's a, there's a part of the gospel that's just so humbling, like, well, oh, I know that by nature, I don't deserve this, but, but adoption is where you understand, you can't earn adoption, you can't scheme for adoption, you can't bargain for adoption. All you can do is receive the spirit of adoption. That's all you can do. And he comes in and he offers this and he says, I want you. And you know what? Being loved is kind of cool, which is like why, why sometimes you'll hear about like a, a girl that she's like, well, why did you get pregnant? And she'll say, I got pregnant because finally there's someone in the world that will love me. And I've heard that so many times and it breaks my heart because people have radically, A, overestimated how much children will love you and B, radically overestimated how much love in general. That people say there's something about the power of love. It's It's not the power of love. It's the power of the person that's giving the love. If some peasant loves you, that's nice. If some middle-class person loves you, that's fine. But my friends, the gospel is not that a peasant, it's not some middle-class person, it's not even that someone that's in the upper crust has loved you. It is that the king of all the kings and the lord of all the lords and the benefactor of all of the benefactors and the daddy of all of the daddies and the emperor of all of the emperors has walked into the orphanage called sin and said, I want you. You're like, what? I want you. And it's like, somehow he's like, I want you. And you're like, whoa, whoa. And something about this love that is so deep and it is so big and it is so wide that when his love gets on somebody, it actually changes people's very nature. Like your spiritual DNA changes. All things become new. Dead things come alive. This love isn't like anyone else's love. This isn't just like the love of a baby. This isn't just like the love of a man. This isn't just like the love of a child. 
this is the love of all the loves and it gets lavished on you and it lifts you up so that when you look in the mirror, maybe the peasants of the earth don't like what they see, but you know better because the king's already spoken and he says 10 out of 10. Amen. Amen. See, see, it's not until you know yourself as a son that you're, you're humbled, but then you're exhilarated. Do you, do you understand that 10,000 years from now, you're going to look at yourself in the mirror and say, what in the world? How did you do this? And I'm not talking about nasty. I'm talking you are going to be stunned with the glory that God has put upon you. Mike, I don't think you should lift people up. No, no, it's all Jesus. It is all the love of God. See, see what's, the, what's the application of this sermon? Here's the application of this sermon today. Verse five, for those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, they set their mind on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Life and peace. He, he, he uses a word here, to, a Greek word, talking about the mind. And it's, it's almost like saying, saying this, um, this is almost how the construction goes. Those who mind, those who are mindful of, those who mind the flesh, they just walk in death. When you mind the flesh, you live like an orphan. But when you mind the spirit and the things of the spirit and the realities of God and the realities of God's kingdom, when you mind that, then you live a life of life and peace. Now I got... I had a, a southern grandmother that would say, boy, you better mind me. You better mind your manner. You ever heard that? Mind your manners. You better mind me. Who you get. See, what he's saying here is this. You're going to mind somebody whether you know it or not. You're either minding the flesh right now or you're minding the spirit. And what he's saying is those who mind, those who are mindful of, those who remember, those who forget not all his benefits as a father who loves his child, his child so our father has compassion for us, Psalm 103. Those who are mindful of the realities of the spirit, there is therefore now no condemnation. Those who are mindful of that, they live in a peace and a power that other people do not know. But the tragedy is that so many people have chosen to live an orphan lifestyle instead of a son's lifestyle. They've chosen to live in the reality of the Smith instead of the reality of the new, night, the new name Christ. They've chosen to, to live. See, see, orphans, that's the reason he says here, you didn't receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear because fear is like a reality that just comes, it's got a whole package with it. When you're living in a state of fear, it's like when missionary Sam comes here and tells us about the kids that get rescued out of human trafficking. We say, what's some of the first things they do? Well, we feed them. Well, what do they do when we feed them? First thing they do, they start hiding the food. They take the food and they hide it in their pockets. Man, because you're an orphan, man, you better get yours. You better watch out for number one, man. You better fend for yourself. You hide it. You're putting it outside. You're hiding it in all kinds. You find a coin, man, you hide that thing. You don't let anyone know about it because you're afraid. At any moment, man, this thing might, this stuff just might dry up. So when you're, a, when you're an orphan, there's a, there's a hoarding. You, you lack. There's an anxiety. Whenever God does it, whenever you think you're going through things in your life, and you're like, where is God? you always interpret the seeming silence of God as the absence of God. Because when you're an orphan, you know the director only shows up once a week. You can't even imagine living in a house when you're in a room and the boogeyman is screaming at you from the closet. You're like, oh no, I'm going to die. I better fend for myself. And what do you do? You pull the covers up over your head because covers protect you from everything. And so you do this, not knowing that with just one confession, your daddy, boom, is right there. Abba, father, See, sons know better. Sons choose to remember. They choose to mind the reality of their new name and their new sonship rather than the fear of their old orphanage. What do you mean? I, I mean this. Every time you're giving into lust, like some of you that, that every time you give into lustful activity, let's say, you know, you know you're living the orphan's life. Stop the, you're not, a, get out of that orphanage. Stop living like an orphan. You're not an orphan anymore. You go to a micro church, you come to church, you're like, whoa, some people, they, they didn't talk to me. Someone didn't look at me. That's how orphans talk, man. Don't talk like an orphan. You know, something happens in your life and you start mur mur murmuring. That's orphan activity. You're not an orphan. You're a son. 
You've got, you got some money in the bank. You're like, uh-oh, you, maybe you're, you're lacking some money in the bank. You get to the end of the month and things are kind of short. You're like, well, I better stop giving as much because we're really tight. Man, do you know who thinks like? That's how orphans think. Orphans think to themselves, I can't afford to help the poor. I can't afford to go help some of these kids that need some backpacks. That don't. I'd love to do that, but I can't do that because what if my money runs out? Only orphans think like that. You serve the God who said your money's never going to run out. See, it's an orphan activity. And, and what he says is, come out from that orphanage and, and come back to your new name. What do you mean by, what does this mean to set the mind on the spirit? It means things like this. See, sons remember and orphans forget. See, sons remember things like God's past provision. When you're a son and you're going through something, you remember, wait a minute. God always comes through. How many of you have ever figured out you're worrying about something? You're like, oh my gosh. And you start freaking out. You're like, oh, freak, freak, freak. You're freaking, freaking, freaking. And then you look back. You're like, wait a minute. This has happened like 8,000 times and it always works out. You ever had that happen? Please hear me. Freaking out is orphan activity. Sons don't freak out. Sons just don't. Because they're like, wait, wait. They, they remember. like, wait a minute. I've already been through this. You lost your wallet, lost your keys, lost your phone, lost your boyfriend, lost your girlfriend, lost whatever. In our case, we have eight kids. Occasionally, we lose one here or there. You know, when you lose one, God always gets them back. You know, now that doesn't mean you don't do anything. I'm just saying, they find a way home. <laughs> I just freaked my wife out. She just jumped over into orphan activity, I think, just now. No, but, but see, when you set, you set your mind on his past provision, you set your mind on his character. Things like God is good and God is wise. Well, what does this mean? Check this out. When I'm thinking like an orphan, I am never thinking straight. When I'm thinking like an orphan, I will, I'm always exalting issues, problems, irritations, and possibilities, and I'm ignoring the realities of the God who is wise. God is wise, and he is sovereign, which means if you knew what he knew, you would let happen what's happening right now. But I wouldn't do it like this. I look back on my life, and let me just say it. Let me make a mass confession. Jesus, thank you for not giving me what I cried out for when I was acting like an orphan, because orphans ask ask for silly things. I have prayed some silly prayers. I'm so glad that God knows how to wait for me to jump up and be a son instead of wallowing my freakish orphan self. What do we remember? We remember his promises. He said things like, I'll never leave you. Yeah, but I feel like he's left me. No, that's muscle memory. I I assure you he hasn't. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. Yeah, but I feel like an orphan. I I promise you it's in your brain. It's in your mind. It is not reality. It is not cosmic reality. I feel like I'm in an orphanage by myself. No, no, no. You might not see your father, but it might be because you've got the covers pulled up over your head. Maybe you've been trusting in the power of the covers instead of the power of the covering of the Lamb of God. (laughs) You You know what this week I was thinking about? I'm a Star Wars fan. Did any of you see the Star Wars episode four, like the, the first one that ever came out? And you get to the end of Star Wars and the Death Star blows up and there's a, there's a, there's a parade and, and there's, they're, they're putting, they're be, everyone's being crowned and everyone's getting like little, you know, whatever, ticker tape parade and, and just it's all exciting and all this kind. And you get to, it's the final chapter of, the, of that episode. And, and at the final chapter, it's like evil is defeated and, and everyone's getting rewarded. We, see, here's what happened. When you're a son, you know that you're in a story where the final chapter is going to be ultimate redemption, where the music is playing, the parade is going, and Chewbacca goes, you know it's going to go down like that, okay? You know that's going to happen. You know that somehow, somewhere, Han Solo's going to say, Chewie, we're home. You know that's going to happen. There's going to be that moment of great glory, okay? But here's what happens when you're a son. When you're a son, you know there's not just a final chapter, and you stop freaking out when you're not experiencing the final chapter yet, because you know that the story goes like this. Things started good. There was a fall. We said no. God said what? And they, we, so we went ahead, and we left, and, we, and there was a devil on the loose, and evil, and injustice, and sickness, and bondage came all over creation. And you know, watch, auditory may watch this. And so when you're in this reality, you know now there is this, 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 uh, these chapters before the final chapter where God... It's going to one day do ultimate redemption, but in the meantime, there are little bite-sized redemptions that he's doing. What do you mean? I mean, it's the end of this whole thing when it says in verse 16, 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory which will be revealed in us. It means I do, when I'm in the middle of chapter 7 and the end is going to be chapter 10, I'm not freaking out when chapter 7 doesn't feel like chapter 10 because I remember, oh, that's right, McFly, I'm in chapter 7. That's 
that's right. What's, there's big redemption with a capital R, but in the meantime, there's going to be some little redemptions displayed and demonstrated by the sons of God. God longs for people in the middle of chapter 7 when things feel like the orphanage to look to him and say, you know what? I know I'm not at an orphanage because I believe by faith what Jesus has done. I'm going to go ahead and rise up and be the son God made me to be. Keeps reading, goes like this, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing. This is, this is stunning to me. Creation is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it and hope that the creation itself will be set free. You get, watch this. Creation itself will be set free. Mike, is there global warming? Maybe, but I know this. It will be set free. Mike, what about all the injustice? There's coming a day. There will be no more injustice. Racism. There will be no more racism. Hatred. There will be no more hatred. Creation itself is longing. What about all the tsunamis? What about all the hurricanes? What about all the devastation? There is coming a day that will all be done. Watch. It says creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Let me say it like this. Your soul, your soul rises and falls on your understanding as God as father. But check this out. This creation rises and falls on your revelation as the sons of God. Creation is waiting for the sons to be the sons. Creation is waiting for the sons to say, you know what? The ticker tape parade is coming, but in the meantime, there are death stars to destroy and injustice to fight and darkness to invade and souls to be touched and dollars to be given and lives to be transformed. In the meantime, there are wives to be patient with. Husbands to be patient with, husbands to receive back massage, things like There's all sorts of things in the meantime. Because why? You are Abba's children. But Mike, what about all the fear? What about all the pain? What about all my guilt? That appendage has been removed. It's time to mind your sonship and not your orphan state. Mike, how will I ever do that? You, you, you wouldn't. Unless this word Abba popped up before Romans chapter 8. And I'll tell you the first place it comes. And I ended on this. is Mark chapter 14. Jesus, the only begotten son, comes to the earth. He's in the garden of Gethsemane. He's been sweating blood. And when he does, he comes to them. He comes to them now. And verse 36, he prays to God. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will but you will. See, ever since the Garden of Eden, when humans had been so close to God, when you know God as daddy, when you know him as daddy, there is no fear. There's lions, you don't care. There's nature, ever, you, you don't care. There could be threatened, you don't care because you're, there's an intimacy. But when humans broke intimacy and they broke faith and they broke relationship, the first thing that happens, of course, they were ashamed of their nakedness but they ran from God and were afraid. What we lost in the garden was access to the one that removes all the fear and all the anxiety, and all the word and all the worry and freaking out. He, all of that came upon us. So God comes himself. God the son comes and he loses the rights, the privileges, the realities of his sonship so we can get the rights and the realities of sonship. And when we get tempted to, to wonder what kind of love this is, I'll tell you what kind of love this is. It's the kind of love where Jesus says, I love you. And you're like, yeah, but, but I don't feel that. To which he says, which is why I'm going to give it to you with the exclamation point. I'm going to love you with thorns in my brow. I'm going to love you with whips on my back. I'm going to love you with mocking and beating and scorching. I'm going to love you with bone chips that went into his flesh and, and the whip would get stuck and then they'd rip it back. Out. I'm going to love you like this. I'm going to love you to the point of death. To which we say, yeah, but, but how can I know he'll keep his promise? Do you understand this? is the only one that could ever love you, not just to death, but from the grave back alive again. And he rises from the dead on the third day to let you know you are not alone. You will never be alone. I will not leave you as orphans. I want to be your father. Will you let God be your father? You no longer need to walk through life all by yourself, fending for yourself for the rest of your life. You will have a paraclete. You will have one that comes alongside. He is called your Abba Father, which is why I end this with this invitation. When you get saved, it's when you confess 
with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that he rose from the dead. I wonder though if there's some of you that need to do exactly what Paul said, which is when his spirit comes upon you, you cry out, Abba, Father. And because I have found there is a healing that happens when you realize that the master that forgave you for your sins is the daddy that's going to walk you right out of your sins. I invite you today to be healed. Auditorium A, Danley, I want you to come and to call people to leave their orphan's lifestyle and to meet Jesus. All of you that are online, all of you that are in this audience right now, if you've never called upon the Lord, this is the day to invite Jesus to be your Lord and for him to be your forgiver and your leader. But even if you're his, if you're living like an orphan, this is the day for healing. I'm sorry for the wounds of your past. I'm sorry for the wounds of your fathers, but I'm inviting you to a healing that comes when you confess, Abba, Father. Thank you for joining us at Greenhouse today. Thanks for being with us in heart and your spirit. Every time we gather in his name, man, he is there. And it's a joy for us to make much of Jesus. We hope that you've uh, really had your eyes fixed on him, worshiped on the spot, and know where to go with it this week. If by chance you need some prayer, we'd love to pray with you. You can email us at, at prayer at greenhousechurch.org and confidentially you can go and reach out to someone that would love to be there to pray with you, uh, to agree with you in anything that you have a need for. Prayer at greenhousechurch.org. Let us be the church with you. And if by chance you just want to make a difference in this world, I, I can promise you this, uh, we are wildly committed to being dangerously generous. We give more than 50% of everything away to missions in the poor. If you'd be willing to help us do this and what we're doing here, uh, why don't you consider giving and being a part of the vision of what it is that we're doing? Uh, you can click on one of the links that'll just kind of show you how that you can give. And literally, the money that you give would be going to change things from America all over the world. Uh, we'd love for you to be a part. Thanks for being with us today. God bless you.